Now, we're pretty sure that folk are doing DNS data mining. That's obvious. Do we have evidence of it? Well, they generally hide themselves. But what we can see is something related to this. Because a lot of times, folk who take logs of DNS queries actually replay those logs. They stalk you. They pick up your queries and then play them back again. Now, here at APNIC, we do measurement, massive online measurement. And the way we do this inside an online advertisement is we customize the measurement by creating one-off names, names that are ripped out of a one-off pad. There's no shortage of names out there. Addresses, yes, names, no. One-off names. And inside that name, we actually include an encoding of the time when the name was created. So if the name is used only once, the time is recent. But what if I see a name that's a year old, two years old? Because I should never ever see this name again. And if I see an old name, someone has captured my query and has been replaying it. Now, this happens a lot, an awful lot. Um, over the last nine months, as, as the graph on the left shows, every day, around six to 8% of all the queries we see on our server aren't real, they're old. They're more than 30 seconds old. So the green line is these replay queries. The purple line is the inline queries, the queries that are in real time. Now that green is odd, it has all these sharp spikes. And on the right, when we look at the ratio of zombies to real, some days, two thirds of the query load that we see on our resolvers is actually old queries. Somebody, somebodies are collecting DNS queries at a phenomenal rate and replaying it back at a later stage. And when we profile this, we actually see these two kinds of zombie behaviors. This is the track of zombies every second for the last few months. The green is the zombie line. And as you see, most of the time, we get around 200 to 500 queries per second. But occasionally, the zombies go bananas and gives us around 20,000 queries per second. These bulk replayer zombies that replay DNS queries at vastly accelerated time frame. So DNS surveillance is actually a very, very mature industry. And what we can see as well is, is there are a number of different players out there. When we look at the delay between the original query and the stalking, a lot of those queries that we saw in the last few months are near real time. I did a DNS query, I get a, I get a, a sort of a zombie replay on the same day. But interestingly, around the nine to 10 month period, there's a second sort of slight peak where queries are being stored in some freezer and nine months later, they come back out. But that's that's not quite as bizarre as this next peak between two and four years in the deep freeze, and then they get replayed. As if someone thinks that freezing a DNS query for four years will somehow eliminate all the personal information, it won't. So there's a number of different kinds of stalking going out there. And we actually look at the folk who send us these zombie queries. A lot of folk actually replay through Google an enormous number, head and shoulders more than anyone else. But you can read this list as well as I can. These are the places where we see these zombie queries. Some folk use Amazon, but a lot of other folk use their own provider network and replay the queries through there. I have no idea who they are, but certainly this is a worldwide phenomenon. DNS stalking is everywhere. Now, that's just a tiny glimpse into this pattern. And I suppose all of us should feel just that little bit uncomfortable that what we thought was, if not private, at least something that was ephemeral. I make a DNS query, I make another, it just disappears into that great bit bucket in the sky. But no, it gets captured and replayed. So what are we going to do about it? Can we stop it? I don't think so. Um, it's an extremely challenging question to think that we could stop this kind of DNS surveillance completely but can we make it harder? Oh yes, we certainly can. And that's what I wanna talk about today. 
the efforts that we're going through inside the DNS today to try and make this process of gathering wholesale DNS data a lot, lot harder. So let's have a look at the various mechanisms that are going on. What is happening in the DNS that makes it so easy? Well, part of it is that the DNS is infrastructure. It's everywhere. So who gets to see my DNS queries? Well, my computer platform, because my application calls a subroutine library, get host by name, sitting in the operating system. And it might well be become a log in that operating system. So a log of the DNS might get created depending on the platform and what I've done as preferences. Um, I normally get provisioned with the DNS from my internet service provider. So I send my queries to them. I don't know if they log, but they can because they see my queries. <clears throat> they might forward it on to another resolver. Well, they get to see it too. And my queries head off to authoritative name servers. And at times, particularly if explicit client subnet, uh, ECS has been added in, they get a sense of my identity too. But that's just the people in the DNS. If anyone is snooping on the wire, listening in the radio waves, if anyone is listening to me, they can see everything too. So how do we make it harder for all these people to capture my DNS? How can we increase the degree of difficulty? Well, let's have a look first at how the DNS works. This is the way you might think it works. There's me, I'm a client, that's my laptop. There's my ISP's resolver, that's who I send all my queries to. And it sends queries off to various authoritative servers to get answers. Yeah? No. The DNS is now hideously complicated. There's not just single resolvers, but resolver farms. There's forwarders. There's all kinds of load balancers. Inside the DNS is a remarkably complex infrastructure. I suspect that there are queries looping around in the DNS for years and nobody's noticed because it's a very weird world out there. Where can you encrypt or where can you intercept these queries? Well, almost everywhere. If I can tap into your client, if I can corrupt your client, I can see your DNS. If I can get onto the wire between you and the recursive DNS resolver you're using, because all the queries are in the clear, I've got you. Or I can just go and ask that DNS resolver, give me a log of your queries. No, they say. I say, well, here's some money. Yes, they say, how much do you want of these queries? Because ISPs will take money however they can. And you say, well, OK, it's just the resolver issue. Well, no, it's not. Because certainly it started with Akamai, but it has become more common that the way they do locality is to actually put your identity, your IP address in the query as an extra option. So even when it goes to the authoritative server, it's not just the identity of the DNS resolver, but I'm attached too. So that client subnet can leak and the servers get to see me as well. So the DNS is full of these opportunities to look over my shoulder. Why pick on the DNS? Well, it's open, it's unencrypted. It's really, really simple as a protocol. It's easy to tamper with, and many folk make an industry of tampering with it. As we've seen time and time again, it's predictable, false answers can be inserted. Some governments do this as a matter of course. Um, Nobody as a user knows what's going on. I don't know where my queries go. It's really hard for me to trace them. And to be perfectly frank, I don't know where the answers come from. It's magic. But that means there's an awful lot of opportunity to substitute false information for real. And the other reason why you pick on the DNS is the DNS is everything. Every application uses the DNS. It's used by everybody. So much so, that secondhand queries are a business opportunity. Farsight makes an entire business out of other people's queries. And as they say, and they are so right, everything starts with the DNS. So if you want information on threat intelligence, if you want information on malware, if you just want information on users, the DNS is where you can go. So how do we make it better? There has been a concerted effort in the IETF over the last few years, really, to try and clean up our act. And there are a number of things that are happening. 
some obvious, some not so obvious, but they're happening and they're cleaning this up a little bit. The first of these is the DNS is overly chatty. It overshares. When you ask to resolve a domain name, mysecretname.jeff.com, it actually sends that name all the way through the DNS. It asks the root service for that name. The root service, oh, I'm sorry, that's too much detail. You need the name service for .com. So I go to the com server and say, I want mysecretname.jeff.com. And they say, that's oversharing. You actually want jeff.com servers and so on. So at all times, the DNS just simply overshares. Maybe I don't want everyone to know the domain names that I'm going after. Maybe I'd like to only share that information with the server for that particular name. Well, there is an alternative approach here. And what we're exploring now is to actually strip down the query so you only ask the bit that's needed. Uh, currently, it's an experimental RFC 7816, but it's being revised in the IETF and sometime soon, or not so soon, it will come out as a full standard. And what do you do? Only ask exactly what you want. Hi, root server, tell me com. Oh, okay, here's the service for .com. Hi, com server, tell me example.com. Not gonna tell you anymore, just tell me those servers. And when you get finally to the server that you want, you then give the full domain name. In this way, you can actually minimize the number of servers that actually know what name you're after. How many people use it? Oh God, 3%. It's so depressing. It's simple. It's as fast as DNS. It doesn't make it any slower. But for some reason, very few resolvers have turned this on. If you run a DNS resolver, turn it on. It protects users. It's a good idea. We've also seen a lot in the DNS of blacklists, of filtering. If I'm in China, uh, try ask for facebook.com. Doesn't work. If I'm in Australia, try asking for the Pirate Bay. It doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Those are real names. They certainly exist out there. It's because internet service providers in various national regimes have, have national laws. And, and those laws and regulations typically require them to intercept and rewrite various domain names as part of a national program on content filtering. As a user, you might not appreciate that degree of control over the DNS. You might actually want to know if the DNS is giving you a genuine answer or not. How can you tell? A DNSSEC, um, a security protocol that started the year after IPv6. So like IPv6, DNSSEC is a venerable protocol. Uh, it's defined in a number of RFCs. And basically what it does is it signs the response with a crypto, cryptographic signature. So if you can validate that signature, that says the response is real. The person who put it in that zone, that's what they said. It isn't out of date, it hasn't been altered, it's a good answer. But DNSSEC does even more than that. When it says no such domain name, NX domain, DNS will tell you if that's the real deal or not, or if someone's just trying to substitute a bad answer, no such domain, for the real thing. So how does this work in recursive resolvers? Well, a DNS response that's been modified by anyone, even filtered with NX domain, won't work anymore. And that means that the signature, the DNSSEC signature will not match. And if the recursive resolver is checking for signatures, it's gonna say, don't like this, and it won't give you an answer. Instead, it will return failure, which is much the same as I smell tampering. Now, serve failed isn't quite that answer. What it really means is try another resolver. So in some ways, what you do when you get back a, a dud answer is you go and try all the resolvers. And if all of them validate, you won't get the answer. So if you're going to use a DNSSEC validating recursive resolver, and there are a few out there operated by Cloudflare, Google, Quad9, or any of these other open resolvers, you want to make sure all the resolvers you use perform validation. Because if even one of them doesn't validate, you'll actually translate bad answers and believe them. How much DNSSEC is out there? Um, the blue line in the middle actually tells you the number of users on the entire internet 
that will effectively perform DNSSEC validation and will not go to a badly signed domain. 25%. It's actually the same as the amount of V6 out there today. Interestingly, down at around 7 to 8% is an additional number of folk who, when they see a bad answer, go, oh, let's try another resolver and keep on trying until they get the answer anyway. Not a good idea. And 8% is still quite a lot. So, okay, around a quarter of the world's users. Where are they? Well, the Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Iceland, have been doing this for a long time in their ISP sector. But there are some odd ones. Uh, and it's not just Portugal, Switzerland, or the Czech Republic. It's Saudi Arabia. It's Yemen. It's Somalia. Azerbaijan. Mongolia. And tucked away in there in Bhutan is a little island of a lot of DNSSEC validation. Well done. <laughs> Uh, oh, and by the way, New Zealand, uh, Eastern Australia, um, they do a fair deal of DNSSEC validation as well. So it's not everywhere. It's not in a whole bunch of countries like the United Kingdom or Italy or Spain, even France, where you'd expect a lot of it. But it is in some places. So as well as being able to detect folk interfering, maybe we want to stop wiretapping. Maybe we want to protect the content of the DNS response so that other people can't just casually look at it. Maybe we should encrypt. Now, we have a standard tool for session encrypted encryption, transport layer security, TLS. And we could use that between my system, my stub resolver, and the recursive resolver. It's more challenging to use it deeper inside the DNS, but even in that first step between me and my recursive, it will make a difference. Now, TLS is certainly quite an old protocol these days. It's well understood. Uh, it's currently at TLS 1.3, and we are slowly getting it together. It involves a TCP session, one bit of overhead, and then a setup of a secure session. But once you've set it up, you can leave it open and put a whole set of queries over it. So DNS over TLS, which is very similar to DNS over TCP, opens up a TLS session with a recursive resolver and passes that query inside that TLS session. No one else can see. I can leave the session open and keep on asking questions again and again and again. And anyone who's tapping the wire, no matter how hard they tap, doesn't see anything. Equally, when I think I'm connecting to 1.1.1.1 or all eights or anyone else, TLS validates who it is. So when my ISP says, aha, I will impersonate Google, TLS doesn't work anymore. Someone's trying to fake it out. So it protects both the session and the identity of the recursive resolver. It's a good idea. Um, you can see it on Android, which is one of the early adopters, where it had this session level called private DNS host provider name, which actually did, from a mobile system, DNS over TLS protecting it basically from all forms of onlookers. Um, it's not without cost. UDP is a very, very lightweight protocol. Once you start doing TLS, the recursive resolver is working pretty hard. On the other hand, HTTPS has exactly the same loads on web servers. So while it's working hard, it's not impossible. Um, it does use a dedicated port, port 853. I'm not sure I agree with the IETF on this. I would have done TCP port 53 and hidden with DNS, but no, we're using port 853. And of course, I may be hiding myself from everyone else, but my recursive resolver still knows all my secrets. So it's a relative advantage. I could go one further and use quick and hide the entire TCP control part as well as TLS so that all that's left for the network to see is actually just UDP packets and nothing else. This is what Google now use for their Chrome browser when they're going to quick enabled servers. And there are drafts out there on DNS over quick that are quite viable, uh, although none of them have actually breached a production level software at this point. No one's running this for keeps. Now, 
there's nothing like a good idea and there's nothing like one-upping a good idea. <laughs> and, and certainly we did go one further with DNS over HTTPS. HTTPS is just HTML over TLS. And we can do the same with the DNS. Now, the beauty of this is that it's hiding in the crowd. It's using port 443. It's almost indistinguishable from standard HTTPS. It can be masked with other HTTPS traffic. And it can use a DNS wire format. There is an option for JSON, but no one uses it. And effectively now what's going on is that the, the DNS looks like all the other web session activities. It's completely hidden. Um, but if you're doing this, why not do it in the browser? The browser is an HTTPS engine. And Firefox have gone all there with their trusted recursive resolver. It actually doesn't use the local platform. It doesn't use the local library. It doesn't use the ISP's local DNS infrastructure. It sends its own queries directly, DNS over HTTPS, to a trusted resolver. What's trusted? Ah, <laughs> the people who Firefox want to trust. So Cloudflare, Google, and Clean Browsing have gone through the various hoops and are configured as trusted resolvers for Firefox. But does it use your browser? Maybe not, because Firefox knows better. Um, I should also note that Chrome have done the same way, but Chrome do it differently. Chrome looks at the recursive resolver you're currently using and probes it to see if it can handle DNS over HTTPS. So it doesn't redirect your queries to a different uh, trusted resolver. It uses the one you're currently using, but encrypts the session up with HTTPS. Um, as well as the, the efforts to encrypt, there are the efforts to, if you will, make it worse. And one of the folk who really started this debate was Akamai. Because when I send all my queries to Google or Cloudflare or any of the other open DNS resolvers, they don't know where I am. They can't give me the best answer because they use the DNS to geolocate. So they decided that they would put the client's identity inside the DNS query what a crazy move. Don't turn it on. Don't use it. It's insane. Um, so hiding in the crowd. Why should I use Google? Why not use my local ISP's resolver? Because in some ways, the queries that come out of Google don't really reflect me. Millions and indeed billions of other people are using Google's resolver. So my queries get lost in the noise. The authoritative server really doesn't have any idea that it can pick out me from all those crowds of queries. So if you are prepared to trust, I can't type, Google, Open DNS, Cloudflare, or whatever with your DNS, then certainly while you're giving them all your secrets, you're making it extremely difficult for anyone else. And Google is a big crowd. One fifth of the world's users send their queries to Google. Only half of the world's users send their queries to the local ISP these days. So Google is certainly capturing a huge amount of traffic. If you look at the pattern, by the way, it's bigger on weekdays than weekends. Enterprise networks are very keen on services like Google's or Level 3's or Cloudflare's. They tend to peak on weekday and not on weekend. What about the other open resolvers that aren't Google? Well, the biggest ones out there at the moment in the world is Cloudflare that blue pattern that just keeps on rising. There's open DNS, which has been there for years. Its market share has certainly been around 2.25% for a long time. Uh, a recent offering by Quad9. And of course, in Russia, Yandex is big, that purple line. Big nowhere else, but big in Russia. So if you really don't want to be seen, what are your options? Well, you can run your own recursive resolver. Now I can do DNS validation directly, cool. But I'm only asking authoritative servers and they don't understand encryption. So all my queries are in the open, bad. Authoritative servers can see me, bad. I can do query name minimization, great. I can disable explicit you know, client subnet, great. Can't really do caching, so it's slower. So running your own recursive resolver, if you really don't want to be seen, is probably a bad idea. 
Why don't I just go with the flow? Just use the resolver coming out from my ISP. Well, if they don't encrypt, all the queries are in the open. The ISP can track me. <laughs> I'm trusting the ISP resolver to do DNSSEC validation or not, whatever it is, it's beyond my control. The good news is authoritative servers can't see me, but I have no control. I even have no control over uh, client subnet. So if my ISP decides to leak my identity, I have no control. What about if I use one of these open resolvers with DNS over HTTPS? What if I would use Cloudflare or Google and send all my transactions over HTTPS? Well, it's not locally visible. I am trusting that open resolver. So there's still a certain amount of trust out there. I'm hiding in a crowd and I am exposing myself to that chosen open resolver operator, but no one else. But maybe I can do a little bit better than that. Maybe I could write a round robin or not even round robin, round and selection. I pull up a list of open resolvers and open up DOH connections with all of them. And every time I have a name to resolve, I flip the coin, pick one of these and send the query down that particular session. No single open resolver can track all of me. They see bits of me. That's good. Authoritative servers can't see me. I should be doing DNSSEC validation locally and my transactions aren't visible to anyone but me. And that seems not a bad compromise. So the lesson from all this, choose your resolver very, very carefully. Um, the careful choice of an open recursive resolver and encrypted session goes a long, long way along DNS privacy if that's what you're after. But the compromise, of course, is you're hiding it from everyone else, but the resolver at the other end of the wire gets a clear view of you. Local DNSSEC validation is always a good idea, but it is really slow. And sometimes the amount of additional time to validate just gets on your nerves because without it, it's lightning fast. With it, eh. So it's a good idea, but you pay a penalty. But sometimes I think choice is taken off you because certainly Mozilla has decided in the United States last October to take the choice away from users. If you used Firefox, it did DNS over HTTPS. No choice, not yours at any rate. It simply did it. And maybe that's the way it's coming, that your application is making these choices for you. And you better trust that your application has your interests at heart rather than someone else's. What do I do? Um, I've played with this for a while and most of the time it works. Um, I use DNS over HTTPS. I use Cloudflare's Cloudflare D. I listen on port 53. I set up my local host on, on local, you know, the local address and all my DNS queries leave my laptop and a port 443 stream towards all ones. Now it's pretty obvious that I'm using Cloudflare because the packets are addressed to all ones, but what my queries are, that's a secret between me and Cloudflare. Am I happy about that? Uh, it could be better but the alternatives are generally worse. So thank you very much for that. Hopefully I'm in time and there might be time for a question or two. So I will hand this back to Sienna and see if there are any questions. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, I can. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Jeff, I appreciate that. Um, we've at least got two questions and we've also had a very patient person waiting with their hand up for a while. So I'd like to invite Mayat to uh, ask a voice question. We'll just enable your um, voice in a second. And if you could uh, announce where you're from, Mayat, and then ask your question. Thank you. So Mayat, if you want to uh, unmute your microphone and ask the question. So what we might do is actually go to the first text question and I'll read it out. I am an internet user. Good for you. But to get to 8.8.8.8 or 1.1.1.1 and before using them as preferred or forced open resolvers, I go through my ISP. I connect through my ISP. Does this, does my query jump past the ISP if I use 8.8.8.8 or 1.1.1.1? To you, Jeff. Well, um, anonymous, it's meant to. 
because it's a bad thing if queries are intercepted. But 8.8.8.8, for example, uh, a a ISP in Turkey set up its own resolver to respond to that address and intercepted queries that would normally go to Google. Oops. Uh, Other countries actually put interceptors at various parts in their network. So irrespective of where this open DNS query is sent to, it gets trapped and answered. How do you stop that? DNS over HTTPS, DNS over TLS. In both cases, the identity of the remote party is validated first. If it's not Google or Cloudflare or whatever you're going to, the session never comes up. So in some ways, you know you're talking to the genuine deal if you use DNS over TLS or DNS over HTTPS. And then that case, it will go to your chosen resolver as long as your ISP lets you do it. They might be blocking. Blocking is an entirely different issue. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. We've got a question, a voice question from Erpan. Erpan, we're going to uh, let you speak. And if you can unmute your microphone and tell us where you're from and what your question is. Thank you. Hello? Yeah, I actually don't have a question. Oh, ah, sorry. <laughs> that was a mistake. Okay, no problem. Um, we are going to go to Swap Neil uh, to ask a question. Swap Neil, can you say where you're from and then go ahead and ask your question? Thank you. Hello, Jeff. Hi. Uh, this is Swap Neil. I'm from um, India. So my question is, um, in the context of P- uh, passive DNS providers, they are primarily looking at cache miss traffic. Do you think there are providers which are actively replaying the DNS queries based on what they might have seen uh, previously or, or logged the queries? And one additional comment before you answer it, referring to your slide, uh, uh, top stalker origin networks, I'm able to see AS38266, that's um, Vodafone India. And that is surprisingly is for cellular users. Thank you. Um, <laughs> all kinds of people log DNS queries and replay them. Um, their commercial motivations behind that are certainly not known to me. But yes, you're aware at, at query ranking number five, Vodafone India, over one month in 2020, replayed 19 million stale queries at me. So it's certainly clear that in these networks, they are collecting DNS queries somehow. Well, it's pretty clear how they're collecting them, but they're replaying them. And exactly why they're replaying them, whether it's to improve their own resolver or to understand what users are doing to gather profiles, I don't know. I really don't know. But certainly that kind of activity profile is out there. Are these cache misses? or are these the queries that hit the recursive resolver? It's likely it's the ones that hit the resolver rather than the cache misses. So yes, um, they're replaying. I don't know why. Thanks, Jeff. We've got one more question uh, from Herman Zeng. He asks, is there any relevant performance data in DOT, DOH, DOQ? This will be the last question for Jeff. Thanks. Right, so that's an interesting kind of question and, and thank you for asking it. It takes longer to set it up. TCP takes the three-way handshake. That's a round trip time. TLS takes another couple of round trip times. So setting up the first query takes a long time. But once the session is set up, I send a query, I get an answer. So once it's set up, certainly it's as fast as UDP on the wire. The only difference is now is actually the encryption and decryption costs. And depending on the algorithm you're using, it can be extraordinarily difficult uh, or relatively fast. Most folk, if they're using something like RSA, uh, would actually find that the elapsed time for DOT and and DOH is almost identical to, uh, to UDP DNS. So once the session is set up, you're fine. The way we justify this is we amortize the setup cost across the next thousand a million queries, because we can keep that session open for an awfully long time. And each time then we make a query, it's immediate. 
And with TLS 1.3, you can actually do TCP fast reopen. You can keep a semi-dormant state up there and resume the TLS session straight away. Quick has a very similar property. So in some ways, I don't think the added delays of encryption actually figure in this DNS argument when we're talking stub to recursive. Recursive to authoritative, different problem, different dynamics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, and uh, we do have one, one further question from Kyo Tet from Myanmar, but I'm gonna ask you, please, uh, as we've run out of time, please email um, nfh at apnic.net if you have any questions that you can't um, get answered today. Um, and we will forward those questions to the relevant presenters. Now I'm gonna hand over to Zabir Khan, the PC chair from South Asia Networking From Home event, who is the moderator of session one. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sienna. That was a magnificent keynote by Jeff Houston. Thank you, Jeff. So am I audible to everybody? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah. So good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining this event virtually. Now uh, we're going to start our technical sessions. First, uh, we have Mr. Shumun Kumar Shah from Pipeline Security. With the vast experience of more than 10 years in the industry, he is going to discuss about DNS security today. He is going to share his experience on how to build our DNS infrastructure threat aware. So Mr. Shumun, please uh, share your screen. With, uh, audience uh hello uh, am i audible yes okay so uh should i share my video uh okay uh it's showing host has stopped Okay. Hi, uh, this is Shimon. Uh, I'm from a Pipeline Security. Uh, so uh, uh, I work there uh, in my technical team. Uh, so Pipeline Security uh, is at work to uh, secure, uh, provide secure internet. Uh, it's based in Japan and Singapore. Uh, so today I will talk about uh, DNS uh, response policy zones um, that actually help us to secure our network uh, from inside uh, uh, threats uh, in our, uh, that is lies in our networks. Uh, host not uh, allowing me to share video. Uh, oh, uh, it's showing host has stopped. Um, yeah, uh, it's okay. Uh, I can continue. So, as we uh, all know, uh, after coming IPv6, yep. I uh, hope uh, uh, you can see me now. So yeah, I, I can continue my uh, topics. As uh, uh, you know, uh, internet is uh, going uh, very far, uh, growing very fast with IPv6, and uh, uh, when it is uh, coming up to connect more uh, devices uh, like robotics, connected car, uh, smart uh, infrastructure, and uh, in IoT, and everything is interconnected. Uh, is up through artificial intelligence uh, in place. So it's now it's a, doing a complex, uh, going to be a complex infrastructure day by day. Uh, it's uh, coming up with a huge uh, functionality. So yes, uh, so it's growing very fast. So network is now a huge, as you were saying with IPv6, it actually will accommodate, accommodate like 340 trillion 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 holes in the network so that's actually huge so if we uh, think uh, about uh, security of this huge network from an operator perspective who are actually need to 
maintain a huge uh, network uh, and every network uh, is co connected with a huge number of holes. So it is not affordable to deploy a network firewall to uh, deploy a security in place for the whole network. Now, as we have uh, a DNS and BGP is the two most uh, uh, critical infrastructure for internet ecosystem. So, and every uh, D, uh, domain uh, query actually started with a DNS query. So, and of every, and in malicious uh, activities, over 91% of malware actually uses DNS. And uh, so a domain name system is um, really uh, important to mitigate those uh, security issues. So as like uh, any uh, uh, legitimate uh, query, in, uh, malicious actors also use uh, DNS to for their malicious purpose. So, so now the uh, DNS response policy uh, zone is the easy way to implement a firewall without deploying any new appliance, without deploying any new big hardware. So now we can actually handle those security threats uh, inside in our network. As we know, uh, DNS architecture is a very uh, 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 distributed architecture architecture and uh, from it, its uh, 3R model, it has issues on accountability and uh, uh, complaints are ineffective in most cases. So there are this resiliency and unaccountability is the greater benefit for uh, bad actors actually. So yes, uh, so as uh, you see, this is a DNS is a most one of the most important uh, part of internet ecosystem. So everyone actually want to use that for his good and bad purpose. So from uh, uh, the other uh, reports, it's changed. So showing crypto miner actually used uh, DNS to contact with uh, command and control in most uh, cases. If we uh, can. Uh, mention, if we mention uh, WannaCry, there was a kill switch to domain two uh, to uh, contact uh, for the, this malicious purpose. And uh, that was actually a lifesaver for many incidents uh, too. So our DNS RPG actually allows uh, our, our existing recursive server to control on the behavior of responses of queries. So now uh, we can overlay custom information of the DNS queries uh, that we are getting from uh, global DNS uh, recursive process. And uh, uh, DNS uh, response policy zones is uh, packets uh, packets with the reputation data. So we uh, actually integrate uh, reputation data with our response policy zones. And uh, response policy zones actually frequent, uh, update frequently uh, via IXFR or AXFR. That is actually zone transfer of uh, DNS uh, the, between master and slave DNS. So uh, in R RPG, it includes both uh, filter criteria and uh, with some uh, response policy zone, uh, response policy action. Uh, it's uh, the RPG actually uh, int uh, introduced by uh, Internet Hall of Fame legends, uh, Paul Vixi with him was, uh, Shiver was with him. They submitted a uh, IETF draft uh, back on 2010. Uh, Till uh, now uh, it has four modifications. Uh, so if you have uh, time, uh, you can check the uh, IETF draft. Yes, uh, there can be actually a possibility to misuse uh, uh, from government and regulation perspective. Some like uh, people can, as we can overlay the queries, uh, uh, DNS query. So if uh, like government and regulation want to block some domain, particular domain 
or uh, uh, they can uh, redirect any domain to a, uh, another direction. Yes, there is a possibility to do that. So yeah, it has both uh, both is uh, one is good, another is for other purpose too. So uh, in DNS uh, RPG, we can take uh, feeds from uh, uh, different uh, feed providers uh, uh, from different masters. Uh, so we can, uh, if so, if we have more data, we have more information about the badness of our domains. So yes, we can take uh, data from different uh, uh, feeds and uh, we can keep our, uh, uh, it, that actually can help uh, the internet. Uh, what actually uh, uh, DNS uh, we, we can block? Uh, so we can uh, block phishing, uh, any malicious domain uh, that is based on uh, um, uh, uh, threat data. So phishing, malware, ransomware, uh, any uh, malicious domains we can block. And most importantly, now we can identify infected machines uh, using this RPG. So if we analyze the RPG logs, we can actually find which uh, IPs are actually infected by which threats. So now we can uh, uh, find uh, the threats and we can find what, uh, who is infected. So how we can how we can implement it actually? So we can implement in our existing DNS like bind, for DNS recursor, not uh, unbound has added DNS RPG from its 1.10.0, uh, and uh, 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 we, we can also uh, use like uh, Infoblocks, uh, uh, efficient IPF5. All those big vendors also have this uh, technology to. Um, block malicious traffic. So this is how actually uh, RPG rule looks like. Uh, if we want to block a domain, uh, like a, a domain name, and uh, uh, we mention CNAME in the zone file, and a dot, dot actually is mentioned uh, an ex non-existence domain that is the next domain. That means now if we want to go to uh, bad domain.net, it will actually uh, answer with a uh, query like uh, non-existence domain. And uh, uh, with response policy, uh, there is some triggers. Uh, 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 mostly we use uh, key name, that is query name, for like when we will query for google.com, that is actually come as a uh, queue name uh, to the DNS server. So mostly we uh, use queue name and uh, to the answer, we use the next domain. And if we want to put the uh, query answer to a uh, world garden, we can use a, our uh, ESC name to our uh, intended uh, uh, domain name. That is, we can redirect one domain to a, another domain with this feature too. And uh, we can also use pass through to avoid uh, any false positive. So before implementation, what uh, uh, we uh, of what actually uh, I maintained and we, I recommend that uh, as it is a firewall, so in logging mode we can implement fast tweak uh, in logging mode, and uh, it's better if we use uh, TC. And another important thing is in network, some people use the uh, open DNS like uh, Google DNS, uh, Cloudflare DNS. So. So I actually uh, redirect all the DNS query to my RPG enabled DNS so that I can keep uh, data. Uh, uh, so I can uh, keep all the DNS query in this uh, safety net. So I can, uh, so I can uh, get uh, uh, spam holes. Uh, there are other vendors. Uh, so if you, uh, you, you can, for details, you can go to dnsrpg.info. So uh, for uh, some, uh, for a case study, if I mention uh, that we used RPG feeds from a spam house, we used to bind, 
and we tested with uh, unbound and power DNS uh, recursor too. And um, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, if you use existing DNS, you can use a forwarder to, a, to your RPG enabled uh, name server so that you don't need to change anything in your uh, current infrastructure. So uh, this is the resources uh, that we need, like uh, bind, uh, for bind, we, we need one uh, server, then for visualizations, uh, uh, we need another uh, resources. Uh, so, and we need a feed from a feed providers. So installation is really simple. It needs more than, uh, not uh, more than 60 minutes to implement these with bind or unbound. It's uh, uh, with our power DNS recursor it's a, a very easy. Uh, one important thing is with bind, there has a zone limit of uh, 32 zones. Uh, so we can use till uh, 32 zones. And uh, this is very simple as uh, a DNS uh, master slave zone transfer. So we, we are actually transfer zones in our uh, recursive servers uh, for this threat uh, data. And uh, uh, it's important to uh, logging. Uh, so uh, uh, in uh, RPG logging, uh, it's important to log uh, RPG and analyze those. So if we see in the log, you are seeing that in a log, we can see the source who is going to a thread destination and we can see which thread destination it is. And also we can see what uh, kind of threats it is. So three most important thing actually we can know from this uh, RPG, like we know the source of threats, we know destination of the threat, and we know what type of threat it is. And uh, uh, it's, uh, we can, uh, like every firewall, as you mentioned, we can find some false positives. Uh, so in my implementation, I find one false positives to a cryptocurrency sites uh, in the uh, uh, feed, there was a cryptocurrency sites. And for those cases, we actually use, uh, we have option to whitelist. So if we uh, mention this domain with CNAME and RPG pass through, that will be uh, uh, the whitelisted in this uh, uh, DNS firewall. So most important thing is uh, we need to have we need to have a visibility on our network from threats landscape. What type of threats we have in the uh, um, uh, network? So analyzing this log, we can have a visibility on the on the threats. And we uh, similarly we can generate alerts and all those things to keep uh, our uh, system uh, uh, intelligent. Uh, so. If we see analyzing this log, uh, we can find what are the top thread domains uh, in the uh, network we have. We can find who is the most infected source IPs in my network. So here you will see one source IP is infected by 7,000 uh, um, uh, malicious requests. So now we have every details of these requests. We, and uh, we can find more uh, uh, metrics like the number of queries, count hourly. So if we anything happen, details like if we see anything more uh, sharp uh, spike on the uh, uh, queries, so it will be, uh, we can see there is maybe DDoS is coming or anything. So you can actually use that a very uh, useful way. So. As you are saying, uh, with this DNS, actually, we have now visibility on our whole network, what uh, uh, queries we are processing, what is the threats inside, so everything we can uh, understand from this thing. And uh, uh, this is a use case in a, uh, Indonesian ISP. Uh, so uh, as you are saying, in seeing in a uh, the, we uh, uh, implemented RPG in a three DNS servers, as you are seeing, why do we have implemented DNS RPG? Those name servers actually uh, providing uh, better performance uh, with less latency. And uh, maybe uh, I was curious, what was uh, the reason? Maybe, maybe uh, as it is dropped uh, so many queries, uh, malicious queries without going to uh, recursive process. So 
it's actually helping uh, DNS to uh, working as uh, more uh, to provide better performance. And you see uh, from this case study, uh, you see uh, there was huge number of uh, 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 malicious requests out there like uh, for uh, a malicious request. There is millions of malicious uh, requests in the uh, network. So that was those rec uh, malicious request was behind our uh, any uh, visibility. Now we can actually can see with this DNS RPG that we have this number of threats. Yeah. So uh, so this is the takeaway uh, that. Uh, the, so after implement that, I actually know that there is actually a huge number of uh, cryptocurrency destiny, request of cryptocurrency destinations in the network. Before that, I actually have no idea that in our network, uh, too many people actually go to cryptocurrency destination. And sometimes false positives uh, are arise. And uh, yes, we have a way to handle these. And uh, after implementation is the, by this RPG, we have visibility to our network from security postures. And now we can uh, identify infected uh, uh, source IPs. And uh, with this RPG, now we can mitigate threat uh, from source IPs and we can mitigate from our own network and we can keep our network clean. So, uh, that's all. Uh, so uh, thanks, uh, uh, audience. Thanks, guys. So if you have any question, uh, I'm here. Uh, you are welcome. I'm here to answer you. Thank you so much, Suman. That was brilliant. Um, as you mentioned, we are open for questions and comments. We're going to have to move quite quickly, though. So please do get your questions in. We've got one by text. Um, can you please share the name of the DNS log? analysis software and uh, is this free software? That's from uh, Ma uh, Mahadi. Yeah, uh, yeah, there are some uh, log analyze like uh, you can use uh, free, uh, like Logstash, you can use Logstash to analyze logs. It's free. So yes, I uh, have that option to use it. Fantastic. Um, I'm just going to leave the um, option uh, up for a little bit longer for questions. Um, I just wanted to say, um, Suman, that it's lovely to hear the Dakar traffic behind you. <laughs> um, so if we don't have any other questions, um, I'm going to uh, throw back to Zabia. Thanks so much. Yeah, uh, thanks, Anna, for handling the Q&A session. So thank you very much, Mr. Suman, for your input to the community. Now uh, we have our next presenter, uh, Mr. Warren Finch from Epinic. He will be discussing about popular open source tools. So these uh, tools are used to monitor attacks, breaches, and simulations to measure the strength of a network or critical business data and infrastructure. So Mr. Warren, please uh, start your presentation. Thank you for that, Zabir. So, Simon, that was a good segue into my talk, talking about the DNS visibility and what is on your network. So that's what I'm going to be talking about is breach and attack simulation tools. So the idea behind that is those tools can measure your defensive capabilities. And then I'm going to talk about the MITRE attack matrix and how you can utilize that to document what's happening with your security posture. And then I'll give you some examples of some tools that are free and open source and be able to implement a test in your own network if you want to do that. So with the breach and attack simulation tools, the idea behind these are to simulate adversarial activities and be able to do that with some sort of automation. And it's based on these common threat intelligence that's out there, referred to adversarial tactics, techniques, and common knowledge. So a lot of the certs will advertise or give you CVEs or indicators of compromise saying, 
this is how this particular malicious actor will get into your network. So when we think about it from a breach and attack simulation point of view, you're going to use these tools so that way you can measure your defensive capabilities. So the idea is that you would run a simulation, collect evidence by looking at your logs or your alerts. And then if you didn't detect some of the capabilities or some of those tactics that were used against your network, you then they need to develop some sort of detection. So for example, with the DNS RPZ, they didn't know about the cryptocurrency being on their network. And so by installing the information of the RPZ DNS, they were then able to get dashboards that showed them that sort of information. So the idea is once you know that there are some problems on your network, you can then look at ways of defending against that. So to give you an example of that, if we look at the pyramid of pain, which is down in the bottom right hand corner there, hash values. Most networks and workstations will have something like a antivirus detection on the endpoint systems or some sort of way of comparing a file that is downloaded with some sort of hash to determine whether it's malicious. So that's fairly easy. Most of us will have that on. Access control list will be used for IP addresses and so on. But if we work all the way up to the top in the red, it gets a lot harder to detect those. So I've given some examples of that. Some examples of that is that the command line PowerShell attacks. How can you tell if an endpoint is doing that? And can you detect all of these malicious items that are there? If you can detect those, how and can you prove it? So if someone came to you and said, have you found any of these? And so when we look at that pyramid of pain, you can go into a lot more detail with these questions and ask about that incident response hierarchy of needs. So at the start, most of you should have what's in your network, an inventory of devices. And then you should be collecting at, at a minimum some telemetry, NetFlow or something like that that then helps with the detection. And can you detect all of the traffic that's coming through your network? And obviously, as you go up, you're going to have to have more labor intensive. So triaging, going through and threading and hunting and finding that information. So when we look at this, if you're new to this and don't know some of the techniques that are around, this is where the attack matrix for enterprise comes in handy. The idea is that it has created a, a matrix that you can use in regards to a common threat actor that's trying to get into your network. So across the top of this, you will see that there is the different ways that they'll get into your network. So initial access, execution, persistent, privilege, escalation. And then down the column, you will see the actual technique that is used in that area or that category. So drive-by compromise, hardware additions, spear phishing attachments. They're all different ones that occur from there. So based on that, you can drill down and get more details about a particular technique. So for example, here, with the attack matrix, it's been around since 2013. So it's starting to become quite mature and more and more organizations are going to be using it. And some of the uh, defensive software that's out there, they actually will map you some of their defenses to the attack matrix. So the idea behind using the attack matrix is that you've got some sort of Intel team in your network and you've got your blue team in your network, possibly. And the orange is referring to the malicious actors. So normally there will be a user or a group that will use some sort of technique to do a tactic against your network. Or they may use the software and that software uses the technique and the tactic to attack your network. 
as a blue team, you should be hopefully detecting those techniques and logging those somewhere for further investigation. With the further investigation, you should be able to then go in and map that. So to give you an example of that, I've gone through the attack matrix here and I've looked at a threat called TrickBot. So some of you may know about this, it's been around for a while, but it has now been mapped against the attack matrix and you can see how it gets into your network. It gets in via a spear phishing attachment. Now TrickBot is basically a Trojan spyware that targets different banking sites. And so the idea is that they'll use some sort of phishing email trick someone into using their link and downloading the malicious execution. And then it builds through and starts getting into the different parts of your network. Just to give you a better example of that, if we just flip over to the website itself, you can see it here live. And so what I can do is just go down to the spear phishing link or spear phishing attachment, if I click on that link, it's going to then drill through and tell me a little bit more detail about that. Who are the threat actors that are more likely to use the information? And then going all the way down to talking about mitigations and detections for that. So you can now start building your defenses to better suit that. If you drill down to the trick bot, it gives you more details about that as well. And it also has in the right hand side here, this new attack navigator. And if I click on that, I can click on view and that actually maps it that against the, the matrix. So that way you can find out what areas you need to do. So based on that, we can now start building up some sort of way of checking that our defenses can hopefully defend against TrickBot or whatever malicious actor there is out there. So from the malicious actor point of view, if someone comes to you and say, are you secure? Is your network able to defend against this new threat? You would be able to maybe map it against the attack matrix and then see how it is there. So from there, we can then build out a little bit further on that. So that's where these open source tools come in to help you test your defenses to make sure it works. So here's a list of some of the more common free open source ones that you can use. And I'm just going to give a quick overview of a couple of those, and then I'll demonstrate at least one of those. So Infection Monkey, that was one of the easiest ones to set up if you're in the cloud environment. So if you have a cloud environment, I tested this on Azure. It was in the marketplace very simple to install. It actually has two components. It has the monkey, which is the agent that goes and infects the different machines and propagates through the network. And then you have the monkey island, which is basically the command and control server that you set up your, your tasks to then do your attack. And then it gives you a visualization. It's quite a good visualization tool to see how it propagates through your network. So it works quite well. I did try to do an on-premise virtual instance of it. I wasn't able to get that to work. And that was about 12 months ago. So I haven't really gone back to it from that point of view. Meta is one of the better ones that I like. Very easy to set up. It comes in, uh, like you can set up in the container environment or a virtual environment. And it uses Redis and Celery, as well as Python and Vagrant to do the simulation. And you do need to have some sort of virtual machine or endpoint that you're going to test it against. So the idea is that it's going to test mostly your host protections that you have in place. But if you point it to a host that's over the network, then you should be able to test your networking tools as well to see if there's any malicious traffic on your network. What it does is you create a YAML file and then you pass that to it. So to give you an example of that, if we go to here, down in the bottom 
is the actual agent that's running the remote execution code or the malicious being the malicious component. And it's running a remote command execution, trying to get information about net user, which is a Windows command. So a listing of the local user, then the domain users and try and get IP address and things like that. So if you think about your network, how have you got, or what have you got in place to detect that? Up in the top left-hand corner is the starting of the virtual machine using Vagrant. On the right-hand side, you have the actual Redis database. And then down in the bottom right-hand side is the celery that is the queuing of the actions that you want to attack with. So to give you an example of this, I'm just going to run a five minute video. So hopefully you can see that. So what I'm doing here is just opening up a terminal window. I've used GitHub to download the scripts and I just change in and run the Redis server based on the scripts that are from GitHub. Obviously, there will be some required software that you need to install first, but in theory, it's very simple to set up. I now change into the virtual environment inside Meta to get ready to run the celery. And then I'm just going to run another Python virtual environment. And then I'm just going to use pip install to start it. So that goes off and installs all the requirements for Celery and then I just run the Celery script. And I just leave that idle while I now get up my Vagrant box, which is basically a Windows 10 virtual machine. And this is where I'm going to attack. I'm, that's the victim machine that I'm going to test these scripts against. So I'll just use the vagrant up command and that will hopefully start bringing up the virtual machine. Now that takes a little while to prepare. So while I'm doing that, I'm just going to bring up another window to start the YAML file attack. So change into the meta directory. Now, as you can see, it's still doing some actions for bringing up the virtual machine in the background. So if you want to check the progress of that, depending on the golden image that you've got maybe for your systems, you can just go into VirtualBox at the moment because it's just running in headless mode. You can just see where it's, what state it's at. So I'm just going to put in the command ready to run against the victim machine, but it's, you can see it takes a little while for that victim machine to come up. So I'm just gonna, as I said, go into VirtualBox to see if it's there. And I can see that's still starting up the Windows 10 machine. So I'll just close that down. And I'm going to wait for the script to finish. And now that it's finished, you can see that it's got the machine up and running. And I now press enter. And I'm going to start running my script against that. And this is where it's pushing out the remote command execution commands to try and get some initial recon about that endpoint system. So if I go into that endpoint system, now this is the last stage of the testing is to find out have I detected any of these commands? So at the moment, I'm testing just the basic Windows 10 environment. So if I go to an event viewer and I try and look for these codes. So for example, event ID 4661 should maybe show me command line queries or something like that. So if I go into the Windows log, security logs, if I do a filter on a particular code, do I actually see that malicious or that initial recon on my endpoint devices? And that's all I'm doing here, is just going through and checking that. So I just need to wait for my security codes. Click on the filter. Go 
go to the ID 4661. Oh, sorry, 6441 from memory. And as you can see, there is no events recorded. So that means I would need to have to change my auditing for my end devices to be able to detect that. And that's it. So some of the other options that are available is Flight Sim. So this would go well for the RPZ installation. So this does domain name service tunneling and looks at at domain generation algorithms. So again, see if you've got visibility in malicious domain names on your network. Caldera is from the MITRE research project. So if you want something that is going to match with the MITRE attack matrix, this would be perfect. But the problem with this one is it's mainly for a Windows domain environment. So it may not be suited to everyone that's here today. And the framework is very similar. You have an agent that runs on the client. You have a web server and database, and it then collects and runs the attacks. The good thing about this is the reports are very well detailed. So good idea to look at that. Blue Team Training Kit. Again, this is good for training your defensive security teams. It also does network traffic replays and malware sample simulations. So that, again, is perfect. For those people who are just starting out, I would suggest the Atomic Red Team. The reason for that is that the Atomic Red Team allows you to run one of the commands at a time. So it's more of a manual process. And the big advantage of being a manual process, you get to learn how to do it. Therefore, you learn how to defend. So if I go to the Atomic Red Team's website, you can see details here and you can go into more detail about how to run a particular command or not. So which one would I choose? Well, it depends on your environment. And so I've just done a comparison here based on the MITRE attack framework uh, tactics and the names and whether it's yes or no, you might have a different opinion for that. I've only got a couple of minutes left. So I'm just going to let you look at that on your own when the slides are made available. And I just wanna mention there's a new system that's available. I went to a security talk a couple of weeks ago, and this is made available to those people who attended the talk. It's still in beta at the moment, so it's not publicly available, but I've put a link to the YouTube. It actually has some of the adversarial emulation tools already built into this Ubuntu virtual machine, plus some other tools in there. It's, if you've heard of Kali Linux, then this is a similar tool that you can use. Highly recommend you have a look at that video and learn a little bit more about that. Or if you want, you can look at Red Hunt OS. I don't think this was very mature when I used it a couple of, um, probably 12 months ago. It needed a lot of work to make it work. The best thing was the Atomic Red team worked well, the others not so well. So it's probably improved now, but have a look at that as a solution if you wanted to go ahead with that. And some links that you should have a look at is the MITRE ATT&CK framework. There's also a new framework that's available called the Tech framework. And that is basically how you can map your network detections to the ATT&CK framework. And so that way you can then have a tangible improvement over time. And it gives you a scoring of that. And last week, Risky Business did a podcast with ATT&CK IQ about the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So you might be interested to go listen to that as well. So I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions. Any questions for Warren, apart from where do we get these brilliant slides, which the answer is on the Networking From Home website, all of the slides of all the presentations are available. I'll give about one more minute uh, if anyone wants to, to pluck up the courage to ask a question of Warren. Um, and I just wanted to remind you that we um, really want you to share your photographs of you networking from home um, using the hashtag NFH uh, on Twitter and Facebook. And we have some great networking from home t-shirt prizes um, for the best ones. Uh, we've got another question about slides. All the slides can be avail are available at the Networking From Home website. I think we might um, throw back um, to Sabia now. Um, are you there, Sabia? 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Sena. So thank you, Warren, for your nice presentation. And uh, I believe people will be uh, benefited from your uh, tools and uh, checking their network string. So now uh, I think we're up for a short break and uh, uh, it is a 10 minute break. Uh, we're going to come back very soon and we're going to join uh, in our next technical session. So hope to see you soon, guys. Thank you.
welcome back everyone and thanks uh, for those uh, who joined us during the break. I hope, hope you have a mo had a moment to have a refreshment um, and get ready for our next session. We've got some really great presentations coming up on manners in Bangladesh and also full automation with diagramming at NIXP, plus a brilliant uh, panel discussion on how networks are dealing with COVID-19. I'm going to hand over now to Swap Neil from I IN Nog, who is the moderator of session two. Thanks, Swap Neil. Thank you, Sienna. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are about to begin with the second part of the event. Next up is Anirban Datta. Anirban is the assistant manager at Fiber at Home Bangladesh. At Fiber at Home, he has been working with major ILD operators like Tata, Bharti, and Equinix. He will be presenting on mutually agreed norms for routing security and sharing his experience and challenges faced in Bangladesh. Anirban, the floor is yours. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, so thank you, Shapnil. Thank you very much for letting me to share my presentation. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Onirvan from Fiber from Bangladesh. I hope everyone is uh, in good health uh, in this pandemic situation. So let's start my uh, presentation. Uh, my topic is about the manners introduction and the challenges I have faced in Bangladesh, as well as I will share some statistics on uh, South Asian countries. First of all, I should admire myself uh, to my, express my deep appreciation to Aftab Siddiqui Bhai and Kevin Manuel and the Manners team to help me on this project. Here is the background. Uh, right now, like around more than 68,000 of network operators or the ASNs, uh, I should say, are connected in the real world right now in the internet society. And also uh, like around more uh, 10,000 multi-home ASNs are here which are connected more over to other operators. So how these op networks are connected? The most uh, vital uh, protocol right now are using is your BGP. BGP is based entirely on the unverified trust between the networks. So there is no built-in validation. So that's why the routing system is under attack. Now, here are some uh, incidents which was called in, uh, which, we, which was happened in the last couple of years. So we can just check it out uh, there in 2008 and 2019. There are some uh, actions happened, incidents happened in the last couple of years. Uh, first of all, the, what was happened, one was route hijacking. This is nothing that someone just announcing someone else uh, resources or the IP addresses which, which is not his own IP addresses or resources. That's why this, uh, it can be accidentally or can be deliberately these types of works which suffers the victim and outage. And the next one is route leak. What is route leak? Uh, it's a man, I, I've, I've, I have experienced a busy, this uh, has things happen in my country also, lots of ISPs who are connecting with others uh, 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 upstreams. They just created, uh, uh, whatever he receives from one upstream, he just uh, uh, advertise all of this to other upstreams. That's why these route leaks happen and uh, uh, you have made yourself a transit, right? So this source of uh, uh, routing attacks and incidents are going every day in, in our day work. For this reason, manners are here. This is known as the mutually agreed norms for routing security, which means that Manners is it's it's a it's a well community with some uh, routing uh, security minded people, which is supported by Internet Society, and we are trying our best to uh, mitigate some well known uh, uh, threats in our routing security, and definitely we establish the industry's first uh, and best practices. What are the actions? There are some actions which are uh, going on with uh, uh, manners. First one is filtering. It prevents the prepa uh, propagation of incorrect routing information, right? So uh, well, it, it will correct your announcement as well as uh, your the client's announcement, which we are advertising or which you are receiving from the clients. 
second one coordination this is mainly the contact information what you are in your, what you have got when you got your resources from your irr you just update the daily or at least six months when you have any change in your contact information in your IR databases. And the third one is global validation. When you originate any kind of prefixes or any kind of resource in your network, please validate that in your RPKA database or create a RUA for that database. And the Fourth one, which is optional in our uh, four action, that is anti spoofing. You, you can use URPF or ACL in the interfaces. URPF is a little bit difficult because uh, lots of ASS are now connected into different uh, uh, two or three uh, ASN numbers. So that's why the strict mode of the URPF is very much difficult. So at least if you can use uh, ACL or the prefix list in the access list in uh, interfaces, so you can, the router can at least verify the source IP addresses. These are the actions I, I already have talked with you. Uh, here are, you, you will find some uh, uh, links over where you need to practice uh, all those things and the uh, links where you need to put your contact information. You can check it out. And here are the challenges. Filtering, absence of proper prefix filtering. Yes, I have already talked about you that uh, lots of uh, ISPs right now are connected with two upstreams providers. So please make sure what you are receiving from the IS, uh, upstream providers or the IAGs or the transit providers and what you are going to advertise to other upstreams. It's your prefixes or your resources and under your resource, uh, your ASNs. That should be the advertisement protocol, but do not advertise anything from other upstream to others, another upstream. Second one, anti-scoping. Please at least put a prefix filter or ACL in the interfaces so that router can validate or the verify the source IP addresses. Third one is coordination. Please, I have seen lots of people who, who have joined in your company or when you got the resources from the IRR, he just sweeps uh, the company from other, he, maybe he switched to other company after four or five years, but you did not uh, update your contact information in the RIR database. That's why we, it is very difficult for us to communicate with you guys to, for help or any kind of issues what happened uh, because of your ASNs or below your ASNs, right? And the fourth one is global validation. Please make sure when you have advertised or originate any kind of prefixes, whatever it is V4 or V6, create a ROA or route object for that specific prefix. Because lots of people are right now are uh, advertising towards us without any kind of uh, ROA or uh, route object towards us, please or, uh, accept these prefixes uh, requested us or mailed us, but we cannot because we didn't find any kind of information. So we need to get back to you again, that please create the route object. So it's time consuming. So please check your prefixes, wherever, what you are doing before announcing it to the transit providers or your option providers. Now, here are some statistics of South Asian countries. First of all, the Afghanistan, the incidents, you can see only five incidents in last one year from May 2019 to May 2020. And the routing completeness, the RPKI, it's, uh, it's not that much. It's like around 20, 15 to 20% maybe, but it is increasing, which is very good. And in Bangladesh, there was 40 incidents and the culprits number was 20. It's decreasing in this year. And the RPKI, it's very much good in progress almost like near to 100% of RPKI readiness. Bhutan, excellent. In last one year, there is no incident and no culprits over there. And the RPKI is almost 100%. And right now, maybe it's, it's like 100%. And in India, uh, the RPKI readiness is not that much. So uh, we need to focus on that, guys. And uh, Maldives also, they are very good. There are no incidents in last one year and also the culprits, no culprits over there and the RPKI is almost near to 100%. 
and in Nepal, yes, it's nice, but uh, the incidents, it's happened maybe like around uh, April or May this year, and the RPK is almost near to 100%. In Pakistan, it's fine, though it is the incidence is increasing in this year, also their RPK value is there, maybe there are some other issues due to this incidents happen. And in Sri Lanka, uh, there are no uh, incidents in last uh, may, less than one year. Maybe the May 2019 was the last incident, and then it's clear. And the RPKI validity is almost tens to hundred percent. Now, statistics of South Asia. Here is in last one month, like in May, only we have only 63 incidents and uh, 53 culprits over there. So. Here is the most important part. Only valid RPKI is 31% and near to 70% or 68% is unknown. So guys, please edit your ROA or the RPKI values over there. One year statistics of South Asia, it's like 120 incidents happened in last uh, 2019 May to 2020 May. And uh, the RPKI is near about 30 to 35% in all over the, these eight countries. And this is the global statistics. In last one month, in the May 2020, uh, 1,130 incidents happened and the culprits over like around 900. And the RPKI here, yes, it's valid only 21%. And the uh, unknown is like around near about 80%. So here is also we need to focus on it. Now, what is the uh, current scenario and manners participants as of 11th May? 365 network operators, 500 plus uh, ASNs are connected in our uh, community. 52 IXP is there, eight CDNs and content providers and 11 partners for promotion and capacity buildings, all those things, right? This is the demography of participants. Here you can see mostly US and Brazil is there uh they have uh, captured almost 50 percent of the whole demography and other countries is a little bit low so kindly join with us here is the manners participants in bangladesh around right now maybe like uh, eight, 810 asns are advertising in bangladesh only seven asns are participating in bangladesh where it's less than one person so we need to focus on that and also most of the ISPs are already confirming the manners actions, but maybe they do not aware about the, this community. So I'm requesting you guys, so please come to us, add you, uh, check your network so that we can create a routing secure network. Here you will see a routing tutorial. Uh, just go to the uh, URL I've seen here and you will find all the details how to implement your actions in your network. Now, the, here is the Manners Observatory. It's an excellent uh, observatory, which Manners uh, uh, implemented. Like this uh, uh, tools is based on some uh, publicly available data sources like BGP streams, CIDR report, Kaida spoofer database, RIPE databases, so and so. And this observatory tool is, it, it impartially benchmark the ASS to improve the reputation and the transparency, okay? So this observatory has two view. One is public view and another one is private view. In the public view, uh, region, you can check the region, economy, predefined groups like manners over there. And in the pi private view, people uh, who are the participants in manners can, uh, can access to the detail of any kind uh, about your essence or any kind of incidents what happened in your network. Let's see what happened. This is the dashboard of uh, the observatory, which you can see in public view. Do not need to be a participant of the manners. You can see easily, just click on the uh, map and you can see this type of, say, so I have seen, I, I've told you that the count is like around 810 ASNs in Bangladesh right now. And the private view, this is the view of a private uh, 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 participants who have uh, participated in our manners community. Uh, he, it, lots of detailed information also over there. Also, uh, this is the page where you, if any incidents happened, you will 
find it here and just click on it. You will get the detail who, who did this, what happened, what was the cause, you can find it out. Now, what is the manner's achievement and impacts? I should go to this slide. Here you can see the number of manners networks, the blue line is increasing day by day. So that's why the gray pillars is decreasing day by day. So our target is to decrease the, this gray pillars near to zero and to increase these blue pillars, blue line. Here is the summary, the membership right now, it's getting uh, more and more. Uh, so please join with us and uh, sign up your form as much detail as you possible. We may ask some question and some uh, tests over here. And if, if everything is okay, then we will be the participant of Manus community. So thank you. That's all from my end. I'll get back to Sienna. Let's have some question. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Anaban. We do have three people with raised hands. So yeah. I'm going to first ask Rashid um, if they would like to ask a question and please say where you're from first. If you just want to unmute yourself, Rashid. Uh, Rashid, if you just click on the unmute icon and then we can hear you. No. We might go to Mayat, who is the second person with the hand raised. Uh, Mayat, please, uh, you, you can go ahead now if you un unmute yourself. Mayat, are you having some problems unmuting? Um, just click the icon and you should be able to talk. Uh, we've actually got a couple of questions in the Q&A, so I might um, ask them here. One's for, the first one's from Anurag. How do you know that there were no cases in certain countries? Please share how, you know, how do you detect leaks slash hijacks in a given country? Yeah, uh, thank you, Anurag. Uh, the first one is it's all the all these things are from the Manus teams. They have uh, we have as I've seen I have told you like around, uh, let me show you there are BGP streams, CID report, CADA spoofer addresses, databases. All these stuffs are here to and also the RPK validator. So these all these uh, results and uh, accumulated in our observatory tool and by that we can detect uh, what was happening. Might it not like that it is 100% correct, but almost correct it is. Now, um, I'm gonna throw uh, now to Saddam. Uh, Saddam, can you uh, unmute yourself and ask a question, please? So then we should be able to hear you. Do you want to ask your question? All right, we've lost him, unfortunately. Um, we do have some feedback from Anurag. Uh, glad you mentioned India and surely a, not, a lot needs to be done. Many folks, including myself, are trying hard to get local operators to understand, learn and create rowers as well as validate rowers. Looking at data of India without context to population, internet penetration is like comparing apples and oranges. And there's a bit of a follow-up. Uh, it cannot be correct, says Anurag, unless you full table visibility of all operators in these cases, which I don't think is the case. Uh, we just have also one uh, question from Tashi uh, and then we'll move on. Tashi says, on the validation of routing information, would like to see Manners Advisory asking folks to create those whose objects in authoritative databases instead of any random IRRDV. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it is, there are some issues, Tashi, right? Like uh, in, I have seen in with our ASMs also, there is an example, right? In RADB.net, we have, I have seen that if anyone have any account in the RADB, they can put any information in the RADB. 
that's why one of my resource about la or like the last or latest uh, uh, prefixes or resources or what we have got from epinic someone just originated or gave and create the route objects or all those things in the route uh, rdb and someone and some transit providers i can remember the name of that and they are uh, allow the those uh, prefixes over there so I, I, my suggestion or my request will be the most important part is to keep that databases in your RIR database, not only the in the RADB or others third party uh, databases over there, right? Thank you so much, Anaban, and I'm going to now uh, ask Swapnil to take over. Thanks, Swapnil. Thank. You. Thank you, Anirban, for the presentation. Next up, we have Mark Gruyer. Mark is a senior researcher at IIJ. He has had a vast working experience at various organizations such as Cisco, Foursten Networks, Dell, among others. He has a PhD degree along with two years postdoc at the University of Tokyo. His thesis is about open source, open flow SDN for IXPs. Uh, he will be presenting on full automation with diagramming at IXP. Dr. Mark, the floor is yours. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, now, what I'm going to be presenting today um, is the work I was initiated in uh, 2014 uh, during my thesis at um, La CNRS in southwest of France in Toulouse. Then um, in 2015, we actually deployed uh, the first approach of the SDN Internet Exchange using the umbrella architecture. Then this works uh, focus for Internet Exchange, especially in the point of view of the operators of the Internet Exchange. Just to remember, an Internet Exchange is actually um, mainly a switching fabric, a layer two switching fabric where layer three operators like CDNs, ISP, and so can interconnect with, on top of it, a root server and some other tools who help uh, operators to interconnect and exchange their traffic. But the role of an internet exchange operator is to maintain as critical functions the layer two switching fabric. And then as a focus, uh, different tools exist, automations and so coming up, and, um, but it's not really perfect. Uh, workflow uh, automation is the way today, for sure. It includes a lot of different things to, uh, to be able to manage your network. But if you don't, uh, you don't have the capacity to really uh, program to the lower levels, uh, it has some limitations that still remain in your network, like the broadcast traffic, the unknown traffic, and the multicast traffic management. Those traffic with existing uh, architecture uh, still need to be managed for being able to scale. And the layer two transport robustness and scalability, you need to go to um, EDPN or big line and some other things or like this a little bit overhead and overkill for what you need to do on the simple layer two transport. And OpenFlow with a key part of the SDN for programmability of the data plane is not dead. And you have key advantages, especially for internet exchange uh, switching fabric. He address all the layer two Ethernet requirement, and he can support proactive architecture. Keep in mind that actually all operators are going to connect to uh, an internet exchange. They're going to be there for a long time. We don't we don't connect for half an hour or minutes, and so then when I bring a new fibers, we know in advance. We know proactively where the MAC address, which port will be used, where the location of the, of the information will be collected and so, then it's a very stable environment. An internet exchange is stable. Then why we should get some dynamic type of networks when we get capacity with OpenFlow to get very proactive and stable, not relearning every, every five minutes, the entire states of the switching fabric. That OpenFlow support that aspect. What we pushed here is to get a workflow when the very first thing is we do provisioning. This is already done, internet exchange when they connect by email, maybe some information, as I mentioned, the eyes of the new operator need to be connected. 
uh, and all the different things that need to be um, known before interconnecting the new operator. Then what you do, usually uh, operator those days, uh, they use a piece of paper, they draw the uh, different network when they want to start the, the new architecture, but they do the diagramming at last, part of the documentation. In this case, we're going to do diagramming at first and at least. And the only things you need to do to actually program your entire network and declare the topology of your core network of your switching fabric will be done by the diagramming. And you do testing. Everything you actually been um, changing in the core of your switching fabric need to be tested with the real state and, and fully, fully control plane and data plane testing. Then in that sense, we, we use the benefit of an existing open source solutions with EXP Manager, who is existing for more than 10 years. There's a bit less than uh, 100 IXP using it those days. XP Manager is a full set of tools um, where you can actually um, control different things, but not really the switching fabric itself. This kind of add-ons is support what INX was the, uh, the primary developer. And so uh, with the, uh, INX is an in internet exchange in uh, Highland and so on, and they use VXLAND, some side projects of XP Manager could be used over there, but it does not support the full SDN solution we're presenting here. And we've been adding that solution, integrating it into XP Manager, and the full uh, stack solutions, then we wanted to, at, at first, reduce layer two complexity. We don't want to get to uh, uh, overhead uh, solutions like VPLA, CVPN, and so, as mentioned before, we want to have a full control plane testing. Everything you do, any change in so, you need to test all the different things and scenario before you actually push in production any change. And you do a full zero touch. It means no access to the CLI, no need to change the config, the teeny details can bring, bring down your entire network. You want to go on push on green approach with just a, a, a way of uh, testing and a no side, uh, teeny details, we can turn off your entire switching fabric. Then for the um, reducing the layer two complexity, we use the umbrella switching fabric. Then the validation is fully done with the emulation frameworks called Mininet. We use um, OVS, Open vSwitch, and emulate the full topology, control plane and data plane. And we use XP managers with MS Graph. Mixed graph is um, maybe uh, you you know draw.io uh, is a website you can draw your different diagram and so and they have a core software uh, open source that we've been using and integrating inside XP Manager. And the full proposed architecture is we have on a control on the control side and we have the monitoring part. Then we integrate with uh, Fawcett with. Uh, Fawcett is an open flow controller uh, created in Python, very active community from New Zealand, uh, and Gauge is just there for uh, monitoring uh, the open flow rules in, inside the data plane. And we have Grafana was integrated with uh, Fawcett projects, we dashboard to uh, um, control and monitor the entire uh, switching fabric. And we have the MX graph, uh, then the place where we actually be uh, diagramming and programming the, the switching fabric. And this is all full managed at first by XP Manager. And you can see on the bottom, uh, you have the different vendors who are already supporting it, in different type of hardware that you can find because we are integrated into the Fawcett community uh, and project. Those vendors are actually supporting this approach with Arista, Cisco, Alia Telesis, Noviflow, HP Aruba, and we, we're developing generally on P4 core, uh, Tofino switch, uh, some solutions as well. XP Manager, as mentioned before, is uh, uh, INX, uh, developing it for more than 10 years, is uh, using PHP Laravel, and you have very uh, a lot of tools to be able to manage your uh, provisionings and uh, root server config, uh, looking glass, uh, and different tools that you require to operate your internet exchange. The faucet open flow 
itself um, is mainly very active with the weekly release and uh, it supports uh, Umbrella architecture. Then you can find the GitHub uh, repo and the full set.nz if you want to see more uh, about the project. And the key point here for us is the single YAM file that the one we actually generate with the solution we present here uh, will be used by the faucet controller to control the switching fabric. Faucet includes gauche for the monitoring as well. For the umbrella switching fabric, the umbrella switching fabric, uh, then you can find a, a, a publication uh, on, uh, on internet about it, but the, the key part of it is no more broadcast and per perfect age filtering. How? Because we actually know where the destination, we are unicasting the broadcast. There is no concept of broadcast inside the switching fabric. Uh, then we use for a source running layer two approach. We are actually encoding the path into the ethane header. And then no open flow code switch management with management less approach. And so where is the key point with the, the Tofino P4. And we, we can scale to thousands of host and multi terabit approach. Then we're gonna do a quick demo and it's a short video I will show you. Then what we're gonna do in that video, uh, we, we have already um, some switches uh, inserted inside XP manager, but we want to create a small topology and uh, you know, we're gonna verify the states all inside XP manager of the switches and in the diagramming page, uh, we will interconnect it and it will be only this. And then we can push on green and test the, the food solutions. And then that's what we're gonna do. Then this is the interface of EXP manager. We are on the sections where the switches are already loaded. And then we can see this is Elliot Phyllis's switches in this case. Uh, we have the different members um, already inserted in XP manager as well. If you check the different poll, we already decided we're gonna be connected to those switches as uh, access switches. Uh, we go on the bottom left with uh, what we developed. We, we go on the faucet sections and we have a diagramming bottom. And then we're going to go there and then it will just open up a, like equivalent of draw.io but inside XP Manager. And we already have the different switches who already been provisioned inside XP Manager. And we just have to drop them on the diagramming section and interconnect them then all the information of those boxes are actually coming directly from the database of XP Manager. We draw the line, we select automatically the core interfaces we, we designated uh, inside XP Manager. And when we, we close that loop and you all automatically go for redundancy. This is full redundant architecture. Then we push that new config onto the push and green module and we can run the push on green module. What it does, it will take a uh, few seconds, but what it does, it fire up Docker and some other uh, instances of Mininet to test the full redundancies. It turn off the different links, it turn off the different uh, switches and so on and so on. And it, it tests with the real MAC addresses and IP uh, for IPv4 and IPv6, everything's work as expected. And this, uh, the success of no packet loss. When, now we, we, can, we can just quickly have a look onto uh, the logs who are being generated out of the testing. And then this is gonna be downloaded on the side. Let's make me put them right there. Then we can see here all the details of the testing was being done with the, the new uh, three switches topology we just created. And from there, we just have to push the button and say, okay, go and, and push, on, push on production. And that's it. Uh, this is done. No CLI, nothing more than the diagramming sections you, you, you did see. And he increased to you know, with a very, very simple topology we did here to um, uh, spin and leaf and, and so and complex topology as you want. That um, given project we actually working on, then the diagramming as a unique step uh, once and for all as the as a, as a step that the diagramming is, is not anymore the last things you do, is the unique things you do. And you will include it, the easiness for documentation and so, with the full integration of the zero touch and push and green approach. You need to test control plane and data plane with very difficult with existing solutions. 
Uh, then the multi-vendor management call as switches and so is a part of the hardware we're actually working on in the lab. Uh, and expect to get the first beta code to be released at the end of the year. And then open to question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. I'd like to open the floor for questions now uh, or comments from anyone. While you're collecting yourselves and your great questions, I'm just going to remind you um, that this is the second of a, the series of four networking from home um, and all of the information, including registration, is on the networking from home website. Uh, each of the four sessions, sorry, each of the four events have completely different programs um, that are collated by um, the local uh, NOG PCs. So it's a really great flavour of different um, subregions. Uh, we've got a question from Tashi. What basic proactive flows do you recommend having on the switches before the first packet even arrives? Over to you, Mark. Then what we need is actually three uh, open flow rules. We're op or three open flow rules to define the flow we need to go through the switching fabric. Uh, we, we program the harp uh, with IPv4, IPv4. We're just looking for the RTPF field of the destination MAC address you need to, to send across the switching fabric. We do the same for ICMP, uh, ICMP v6 uh, for N, ND uh, discovery, which is equivalent for IPv6 as R. And we do the MAC address to MAC address. The only three rules we already proactively insert is those one. Brilliant, thanks, Mark. Um, there may be another question lurking out there. Um, I will just also take this opportunity to say thank you to Swap Neil for his wonderful moderating skills. Um, and if there are no more questions, I'm going to throw back. I'm going to throw over to Talina from LKNOG to take the reins for the panel discussion. Talina, are you there? Thank you, Sienna. Yeah, let me share my screen first. Okay, hope uh, I'm audible and I'm visible. Okay, good afternoon everyone. And uh, so representing the program committee, I'm Pinya Patrina from Learn or Lanka Education and Research Network. So as we did in the last NFH event, we thought uh, to include the same panel discussion to express how our network operators in the South Asian region uh, face these challenges of COVID-19 and uh, to share all their experiences with the greater audience of NFH. So uh, today we have five panelists representing five different economies, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. So these are the, the top experts in their field. And uh, now I would like them to uh, do a self-introduction. So you may take 10 to 15 seconds. Shall we start uh, from Anra? Uh, yeah, sure. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, Hi, yeah sure. So my name is Anra, and uh, I work at uh, Hurricane Electric uh, based in India. And uh, I spend most of my time in looking at BGP routing tables, things like uh, any any kind of uh, anomalies or any kind of uh, routing announcements which should not be there. And uh, that's, that's how it goes. Thank you. Uh, so, Alicia, if you may, please. Alicia. Uh, hello. Yeah, Alicia. Yeah. Go ahead. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alicia. Uh, I work for Bhutan Telecom Limited as a system engineer, and I'm representing BTNOC as well. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, Samit, are you there? Yeah, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, so my name is Samit, and I'm from Nepal. I, I work in ISP named World in Communication, and I work as a chief technologist out there. And I also represent as a president of Nepal Network Operator Group. That's okay. how it goes. Thanks, Samit. Uh, next, Subhashini from Elkena. Hi, uh, I'm Subhashini. 
uh, from Sri Lanka and I'm telco engineer and with the experience of uh, different operators and different vendors. And um, here I am representing uh, LK Nog. Okay, thanks, Subha. Uh, then, uh, Subhan, can you please? Uh, thank you. I'm Vishwara uh, Vishwavir. I'm representing Bidnog here, and I was working for Fiverr at home as uh, the chief technology officer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Subhan. Uh, so, I'll go back to my slides uh, where we put the questions. So these are some questions that we came up uh, for the panel and uh, we will be going through these questions and uh, for the audience, if you have any questions, please put them on the Q&A se uh, section. Then uh, with the time permits, I will go with them uh, with the panel. Okay, so uh, as the first question, uh, Alicia, shall I start with you? So the question is, sure. uh, yeah. So the question is, uh, with the uh, with the COVID nineteen incident, we saw different traffic patterns, and uh, there were several pikes. And were you able, were you networks in Bhutan were able to uh, do that, or were it were you prepared for the challenges? How was it? Well. Uh, that's a very tricky question because COVID-19 is something which is totally unexpected and I don't think the whole world was prepared for it. So in that sense, we were not prepared. But then uh, when we look at it the other way, every time, every year we have things budgeted and then so, so that really helped us a lot. So for an instance, if we were planning to expand or upgrade area A and let's say after COVID-19, uh, if we saw increase in the traffic for area B, what we did was we, the you know infrastructures or you know the money that went into upgrading those uh, uh, those areas. If so, we upgraded the you know those areas which were in need after COVID nineteen. So that's that's how we managed. So it was difficult in that. I mean, it we were not prepared. Uh, completely for COVID-19, but since everything is budgeted beforehand, every year it's budgeted. So things made, uh, those things were easy. As, I mean, it made things easy for us. And then okay. we, mm -hmm. as far as the, you know, traffic uh, uh, pattern is concerned, uh, we did see a, you know, exponential rise in our Facebook and Google traffic after the advent of COVID-19, maybe because, you know, many people were updating things and, you know, uh, searching for, uh, you know, various, I mean, looking for status. So maybe the, the, that's one thing, or that's uh, one expon exponential rise that we observe. Okay, thanks, Alicia. So, uh, Anurag, how about India? Thanks, Serena. So, uh, I think probably you're going to hear this answer, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're going to hear a repetitive answer where everyone is going to say no one was prepared. And so that was the case with India as well. Well, no one was expecting that kind of traffic, but there were certain other things which surely uh, helped unrelated to COVID, but over the time, uh, uh, we got a large number of content players located in India. We also got large number of caches across Indian networks. We also got multiple exchanges, uh, you know, being set up and promoting pairing. So at least on the backbone side, at least on the on the content side, uh, things were not that stressed because most of content was local. And uh, as you might have uh, might have heard, a large part of this traffic was uh, was repetitive traffic, which was quite easily cacheable. So any of the networks which uh, which had the option of caching or peering with 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 a with a, with a CDN nearby, they were they were in, in good mode. Uh, in terms of excess capacity, I'm sure it was a challenge for for a while. Uh, but yet, uh, you know, on, on purely on the last mile side, there is reasonable amount of GPON deployed as of now. So I don't think many of the operators had issues. It was, uh, you know, whatever congestion happened uh, uh, possibly for, for, for a limited time as, as one could see in the, in, the, in the spike in latency or slight packet loss were mostly with the things related to middle mile. And uh, as of now, from the last couple of weeks, I see things are, things are actually quite good. Okay, uh, thanks, Amra. So, uh, how about uh, Bangladesh, Suman? Uh, you are muted. Sorry. Uh, 
in Bangladesh, actually, we, we have seen a kind of definitely there is a change, significant change in the issues pattern. Though what we mostly noticed that uh, we actually go in for lockdown a bit early, like in early March, we closed down everything. All the offices is closed, everybody moved to home. And some people moved from the capital to the remote cities. So we see some growth in the traffic in the remote cities. We moved from Dhaka. And in the major capital city, Dhaka, and other big cities who have noticed that uh, the small corporate offices are closed. So there is no uses there. So that traffic actually shifted to the home users. So those ISPs actually catering the home user, they have seen the increases uses. And so they somehow need to increase their bandwidth as well. But uh, in the, those who are actually dealing with the corporate users, mostly, they actually saw the reduced amount of internet traffic into their network. So it's just a kind of mixed situation here. The overall, we have seen the increased traffic in the internet exchange point, where we can see there's some growth of traffic there, around 20, even sometimes 30% growth we have seen. And timing-wise, the pattern also will change. Like, uh, we usually see that in the morning at 9, it goes in peak, and then in the afternoon, it goes down. At night, we see the surge of the home user. So it's kind of sporadic if you look at the usage graph. In terms of economics, if, if I talk about a bit, that uh, some ISP are in real pressure because uh, their corporate is actually gone. Those have broadband users. There's a, a number of broadband users also increased in this COVID time, actually. Some people actually want to have broadband. They do not want to rely on the uh, mobile internet or something. So there we see some growth as well. But eventually, there is a financial pressure going on the ISPs in Bangladesh, especially in the COVID-19 situation. OK, thanks. Uh, Sami, tell us about You are muted. So I think I think it's almost similar everywhere in this region, right? But as someone rightly pointed out, that there is a there is a huge shift on the peak hour traffic utilization, right? Before lockdown, the peak peak hour was around 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. mostly, right? That changed to 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. suddenly, and then again 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. That is post lunch, and then again again night. So there were three peaks we started to observe that the lockdown started, as the most people started to started to work from home. And in terms of in terms of overall traffic uh, rise, we tentatively saw around twenty five percent rise in international traffic, and on the domestic front we saw around roughly forty percent increase, right? And mostly it's it's of course contributed to Google and Facebook are natural, but uh, we also saw a rise in traffic in TikTok, online gaming, mm -hmm. and 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 spikes in Zoom and Microsoft Team traffic as well, right? But on the on the other side, you know, the mobile data telecom data uh, uh, actually is reduced in the in the in the cities where the broadband penetration are high because most of the people they are logging to have home in the Wi-Fi rather than in the mobile data network. And uh, to answer whether we are prepared or not, uh, I think uh, most of the service provided in Nepal they have actually sub subscribed burstable capacity with their IP transit providers. So they always have a sur surplus capacity for the burst, right? So normally the burst is one is to one ratio. If somebody is subscribed uh, 10 Gbps, they will always have a physical capacity of 20 Gbps. So in that way, I think uh, most of the providers were good because they used up the burst. So technically they were not badly, were in a bad shape, but of course finance, there was a financial hit because, because it's just a 25% more they have to pay for the burst, the burst level manual. Uh, but on the domestic front, uh, uh, basically, uh, most of the providers are already over capacity. They are, they are, they are actually oversubscribed, right? Because uh, as to talk from a worldly perspective, uh, during the World Cup, actually we also operate IPTV. So during a World Cup, we had to plan a capacity, excess capacity to ensure that uh, during World Cup, all every single subscriber that has a set up box in their home will be logged in and there will be a huge source of traffic. So we have already provisioned for that that time. And the, and the excess capacity that we have provisioned during the World Cup time, actually we started to consume for the rest of the four years, right? So, so there are a lot of excess capacity, so we didn't see much hit. And on, uh, on top of that, uh, Google and Facebook are large current CDN operators who actually own the contents. They also reduced the default beat rate. So that mm -hmm. also helped, helped us a lot. 
at the end. Uh, so, yeah. so as a whole, I think, I think, I think uh, it's, uh, we should say that we are fortunate that we, we actually coped really well. And, uh -huh. and not, okay. not, not, not yeah, that's good. That. Actually, that's good to hear. So, uh, how about uh, Sri Lanka Subhashini? Is it same? Uh, yeah. Normally, uh, there's a buffer in uh, all the network for the capacity uh, for the spikes and then just like New Year traffic. And uh, also we faced some unfortunate situations last year. So that time also we felt similar, but this time is uh, this COVID thing is uh, uh, last a bit longer, not just like normal spike. Um, the main uh, issue and challenge we faced is uh, that uh, traffic increase in the, within the country because suddenly everything goes online it's education and day-to-day -day other work work from home everything um especially the education platforms and because of that uh, that within the country traffic uh, high increase was there um uh, considering the backbone that uh, we, everyone have that enough and additional capacity and all the backup capacities so uh, using those backup links and all that uh, we managed to do um, that uh, some kind of uh, 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 that arrangements to manage the higher traffic. And this is a distributed traffic. And throughout the whole day, we could see that uh, not in a particular spike, then, then it's a bit easier to handle because we can put some additional capacity and uh, tolerate the situation. I think uh, we didn't face any big issues. There were some, but um, we managed to um, uh, okay, provide good service to customers. Okay, thanks. So uh, uh, then again, I'll start with you again. So uh, in many places, these network operations became essential services. So with these essential services uh, capacity and with the lockdown uh, effects, uh, were there any difficulties for the operators or the engineers to uh, uh, do their work or, uh, uh, or answer their customer calls, prepare us, those things. So how, how much, how, uh, how they were working? They, were they working from uh, office or were they working from home? Uh, Subha? Uh, Actually, uh, network operators uh, already having this distance working uh, facilities in Sri Lanka. And uh, because uh, for some emergency attendance, because normally the offices are in Colombo and people in uh, hometown and uh, such cases, uh, they are able to. And, um, uh, but still there are cases people uh, have to visit the office or some other cases to the sites. Um, Actually, it's a challenge to travel, but there is uh, some. There was some mechanism implemented for this also, and uh, gov together with government, according to the quarantine regulation regulations, there's an approval method implemented. With that, um, it was a bit easier to uh, attend the work uh, when it is uh, actually required. But still, it's a challenge actually because go through this uh, approval process, it's a bit uh, difficult. Go with the PHI and police stations and medical checkup and then traveling also uh, traveling within city that within cities okay but uh, that uh, between cities it's prohibited in that case um, getting the all the police station approval kind of things it's a bit hard but I think all operators ma manage to uh, do this one by getting the essential service approvals. Okay, so, so uh, how about Bangladesh, Suman? Uh, they're a kind of mixed experience in terms of providing services. Uh, so those actually, we are working soft thing like a configuring thing, routers, which we are, we're doing it at, from home. So no question of going to the offices. But those who are actually working in the field, like fixing a broadband connection or a repairing fiber cut, they need to go out. So there are two kinds of experience. In the initial phase of lockdown, uh, though government declared it as the emergency service, so they should go out and fix that. But all the police officers and other in the field, they are not aware of that. So in some cases, they have been beaten by sometimes actually. That's also happened here. Another good thing, you know that Dhaka is famous for its traffic. So in the lockdown time, there is no traffic. So going to the site becomes very easy. If it takes 
ideally one hour 30 minutes now it takes actually 15 or 10 minutes to go there so you can serve quickly so in terms of services in fact during covid time we improved a lot if you look at the number of travel tickets usually we handle per day the incidence is less because less people are moving and uh, so we actually covered a lot of backlogs actually now we are completely updated uh, fixing all the issues which we could not fix earlier like in the major area in the city where they need to dig the road and uh, fix the underground cable it was impossible during the normal situation you have to do at 2 a.m in the early morning to 4 a.m kind of thing but now actually you can work there for a longer period of time so that's how we fix some nagging issues we couldn't fix earlier in the COVID time. But again, there is some challenges actually in moving in the remote press where if, if you don't have any vehicle, then it's difficult to actually roam around from one place to another. And another challenge actually facing at the home, like if a broadband customer complained, he's not, internet is not working. So engineer is going at the door. He had to give a huge interview while you're here. When the actual flat owner is telling, yes, he came to me and he came to rescue me fix my internet problem, then he's allowed to enter. Sometimes he's waiting there for a long time. So that kind of different kind of challenges we are facing. But uh, nonetheless, uh, so far it's good going. Internet is running and everybody's enjoying it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so Samit, uh, I'll next go to you. So uh, again, I want to add something. Uh, so from uh, there's a question from Sohvir uh, asking whether we were able to maintain the SLS as we did earlier. So how, how was it from your side? This question for me? Uh, no, no, it's it's a command, but uh, I'll start with you. OK, so whether were uh, you whether were you able to maintain SLS? Uh, I think uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, whatever Suman Bhai has just uh, expressed, mm -hmm. you know, is that it's a it's a, it's a exact replica in Kathmandu, Nepal as well. Right, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. to add more, you know, to add more, of course, you know, because everything was locked, locked down, we don't also uh, taste much outages, right? So we experienced less fiber cord in the field due to no movements of the vehicles and public, right? And other activities like, you know, that results to uh, cuts and outages were also not happening, right? Uh, surprisingly, we even didn't face a power cuts that used to, used to be very, very common in Nepal because electricity has more supply and the demand is really less, right? So there is no power outages as well. However, you know, Department of Road, Department of Electricity, they found it's a perfect opportunity to maintain the roads and electricity poles and transmission lines. So actually, they actually did uh, some of the outages, right? They are resulted a lot of outages, but they were also duly fixed as soon as I said that, you know, now roads are empty, my, our team just can go uh, as, uh, really quickly there and fix the issues because there are no chaos. But uh, uh, but from an organization perspective, we, we had really tough time to managing a team who can go out and fix those uh, issues. So we actually uh, created a different isolation, isolated team for a critical outdoor maintenance activities, provided with all the safety equipments like PPP, hand sanitizers, adequate safety trainings. And we even created a video materials and circulated internally with our organization to how to remain safe and how to remain safe when you visit the customers or, or doing outdoor field activity. Those teams actually lived in it together in a designated isolated location to ensure that they don't return home and minimize risk of infection. We actually avoided the rotation mix of things because rotation means you are infecting impact. Uh, we are exposing everyone. So we just created an isolated team and they were, they were our fault line heroes. And yeah, that's a big our, commitment actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, network system administration developers, they obviously they were always working from home. So I don't think any any issues, those who were working online, even in the office, right? So, but only for the field operation, we had some difficulties, but we managed it, right? And today, if I have to say, because the lockdown is still on, I would say. Mm -hmm. So out of 3,500 employees that we have in our organization, almost 80%, 2,800 mm -hmm. are working from home, right? So only mm -hmm. six 700 are working in the field. So that's how actually is, uh, we were managing so as i mm -hmm. to, to answer the question yes because there were no outages also so we don't even have to maintain sla for inter customers also and because all the enterprises were closed they were not uh, complaining as well right so so that's how it goes yes yeah uh, so alicia how about bhutan well for bhutan like uh, summit uh, rightly 
pointed out since like especially for system and network uh, administrators it was like same as working before because we like it's whether it's like uh, because of covid or not, even like without covid like things work pretty much the same for like network and system um system admins but for us with regard we don't have any local transmission so we were like not in a completely lockdown situation but then um, after like you know like first covid patient was detected over here what happens what happened was like like schools were completely like shut and then many offices and organization they started opting for working from home so when that happened uh, usually people just uh, go for like mobile internet connection they just have the mobile internet now many people wanted internet connection to homes so we saw you know a huge number of like customers coming up to operators for uh, you know uh, getting internet connection to home so that was one difficult challenge for the network team because we had to deal with like huge number of customers so that that, that was that was and that is still challenging and with regard to you know maintaining like like uh, summit pointed out with you know how like maintaining physical distancing and then you know all those whenever someone visit your premises how do you use all those things and also over here in bhutan we have developed an app where you know each each organization needs to uh, have that qr code uh, you know pasted in in their offices so whoever is visiting that particular office uh, any like we have people you know yeah, monitoring that so whenever you visit a new office any any place like not just office it could be vegetable market also but you need to scan that qr code so that it's maintained you know like you know who which in case something like breaks out you are able to track that so that's happening and the other thing is uh, you know like with regard to slas uh, uh recently like uh, you know, uh, we do have like, you know, like with upstream provider and also us providing to customers. So we did have issue with regard to, you know, the recent cyclone that happened in Calcutta and then the fiber cuts were there. So, uh, you know, we did have a sort of blackout in the country for that, but then it, it's something which is un, unavoidable because it was because of the cyclone and also, you know, uh, the team working from like India, like we have like we are to, our, our upstream provider, Tata and Airtel. So, uh, like since uh, India was uh, uh, under lock lockdown that time, they had difficult time in you know uh, working, and then and th that was a difficult part. But it was uh, not. I mean, it was uh, unavoidable. So that's something that happened. And for us, you know, whenever we need to like go for uh, you know any like if we have any activity at night so any uh, you know like night operations so what we need to do is we need to give get prior approval from police because they we need to we had to submit vehicle numbers to police so that in case they you know uh, at if if they find out and if they want to know i mean they ha already have our vehicle number so that's how the movements were tracked and that's how things are being like you know controlled Okay, thanks, Alicia. So, uh, from the audience, I would uh, also like to ask if you are representing some other country than uh, us panelists, uh, just put your comments in the comment box so we can uh, get to know how it happened. And uh, if the experience is different than this, please raise your hand. We will <laughs> get your answer. Uh, so, Anurag, so as uh, Alicia was saying, uh, so they are getting internet through in India, and then there were a lot of issues like uh, uh, the cyclones and uh, nat natural disasters, uh, just with the COVID incident. So how was it from your point of view? Uh, well, uh, I don't, uh, I don't work for an Indian operator, so my answers are going to be more around things I hear rather than yeah, like you can operators. generally, uh, yeah. So uh, I think for with respect to uh, COVID, uh, there was a major lockdown and uh, uh, there was an impact at least for first maybe 10 or 12 days while, uh, you know, uh, country as a whole was trying to figure out the systems in terms of issuing passes and so on. So I think anyone in middle who had a requirement, they were impacted. If, if anything required, say, a hardware change or moving, moving people around or or you know shipping stuff here and there then it was surely impacted but things like you know which which could be controlled uh, from the software 
uh, things like you know increase in capacity or change in capacity and so on that was much easier there was however an interesting interesting effect which is uh, uh, mobile networks which are usually under high stress they seem to be under 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 less stress in big cities as as more and more people moved out towards their homes in say tier three cities or rural areas and hence you know uh, much of the wireless spectrum is was was uh, was was unutilized in in in, in the scenario so that was that was one of the one of the slight unexpected effects yeah so uh, yeah that is the issues that we face so uh, from the marketing side uh, uh, were there any introductions of new packages to accommodate these uh, working from home or maybe study from home uh, oh, yes, there were, customers? There were, there were multiple, yeah, there were, there were multiple launches of packages, especially with high data and things like, you know, bundling of local content players, etc. So I, I think, I think uh, that was quite on the expected lines, nothing in fancy in there. Uh, you know, as I said, for initial maybe uh, a week or two, there was a struggle. But as as you know, things things were sorted out. Uh, instead of becoming a stress, it became like a good opportunity for the for the network operators to you know uh, serve more and more people. So it was it was in a way in a way had a nice effect overall. Okay. Yeah. So to so, to uh, add more to add more on what Anurag has said, we also had a similar experience here. You know, the initial days of lockdown, we saw a lot of traffic rise in the cities. But as start as the people start moving out to the villages, we start right. We st we started seeing that the traffic in the cities are going down, whereas in the village in rural it's going up, right? So so it it was it was really interesting. <laughs> yeah, I guess it it is the same for every country. So most of the traffic which were in the urban areas now has now moved into the rural areas because of the people working from home. So uh, then uh, I would like to add something for this. So there were a lot of uh, quarantine centers, quarantine facilities created with this incident and uh, whether there were any requirement from these centers to have network uh, capabilities because normally hospitals or things like those places or maybe hostels, they don't provide uh, Wi-Fi or broadband packages, broadband uh, facilities. Uh, how was your uh, response or were there any kind of uh, situation like that? Subha? Oh, yeah. Um, Talina, can I just break in for a second? We've got a great question from Zabia. Can you see it in the Q&A box? Yeah, we, we answered that. <laughs> and the other one in the chat? Okay, chat I didn't see. There's also one now from Naima. Um, in the Q&A. Um, I can read that out quickly if you want. Yeah, COVID yeah please. Sc scams and other cyber attacks have been prevalent in this networking from home era. So how do you, or how are you managing from a service provider perspective? Sami, can you? Okay, so I'll take this uh, question. Yeah. Yes, we we definitely had a lot of complaints from our subscribers that they were they were receiving COVID scam and a lot of other phishing emails, right? So the, so basically we do a basic things, right? So as soon as the complaints comes, we block their domain and block their IP address. That's what we also do, and our regulator also do. And in terms of cyber attack, yes, we have also seen our cyber attacks increasing. Of course, you know the DDoS attacks we see is every day in smaller scale. But this time we also see a larger scale of DDoS attacks in our network that has actually actually you know degraded our service performance for almost a day or two, right? And basically these these were actually the combination of HTTP uh, use HTTP request combined with the U2B based uh, attacks that's coming out from the internet. So yes, definitely there there is a, there is a huge rise of scam phishing emails and cyber attacks. Yeah, Samit. Again, there's another question uh, directly for you asking. Uh... How the I, uh, Nepal ISPs uh, deal with the challenge from education sectors with the online classes, and I would like to uh, put it into everyone. So from Nepal, let's start. Oh yes, so the it it has just recently started. So there were a lot of hues and cries between the governments and a lot of you know civil societies that you know because there is there is a there is a disconnect, right? Because 
not everybody is connected to the internet there is a huge digital divide between the those who have and the who have not and those who are living in the cities have the internet connectivity um, good mobile access 4g data but those who work is living on the rural they don't have it and lots of the lot of the student who has moved from cities to the village now they don't suddenly in the village they don't have a, a good broadband connection good 3g 4g coverage so they will not be able to access the uh, any any online things right Uh, not only limited to classes so th so there is a huge challenge yes and the government is actually we are as of now we are not able to do anything because it's a lockdown stage and we are not doing even a single uh, new installations which are which is gradually uh, gradually changing as the lockdown is getting loosened up but as of now we are uh, to be honest we are doing nothing we are just planning how to how to how to help government and how to help the you know uh, education sectors and the students uh, So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I think uh, we are having another five more minutes. Uh, so, uh, there's another uh, question. Uh, yeah. Storing the services as of now. Mm -hmm. So there was another question from uh, or uh, from Yahya Khan. On the whole, can we say the operators experiencing overall business growth from the pandemic? Uh, Swing page on the corporate side, offset by large growth on the residential end. Suman? Yeah, actually, I I mentioned that earlier that uh, we we really mm -hmm. see some uh, the, the corporate side the uh, uh, office are closed, the small corporates. But again, for the large organizations, they are kind of doing home office. So there is uh, there is a demand. They are accessing their office database information from home. So two impacts is there. They need good quality internet to their office. Secondly, they need to ensure the security because people are working from home from their own laptop. if it is properly secured if it is a, not infected with malware or whatever something that actually eventually enter into your office so that kind of new kind of challenges actually came for all sort of corporate it's not about only service providers for our office definitely is true but it's true for all the small organizations they are actually doing this new normal situation where they're doing actually home office so that is something we need to take care of that kind of can be different kind of attacks also coming up in this area and uh, i like to take two three questions just make one line of comment for a few questions earlier actually passed like one about sla like yeah. during covid it didn't deal that much impacted on the sla because we could manage it but yes what actually alicia was telling that uh, the cyclone that happened it's also affected bangladesh and on that particular side uh, the southern region of bangladesh they are were impacted and we could maintain sla there this is due to that cyclone not due to the covid situation there is a uh, one uh, situation in in during this uh, covid time and uh, another discussion was going on uh, uh, the education right the, the schools and how, how the uh, e like uh, in the city area i can see most of the schools actually doing online classes by zoom or google class or some other tools but unfortunately the villages and the remote part of the country they are kind of missing from this kind of facilities so some of them relying on the broadcast by the television by the government so uh, that is like the only option to keep them in pace with the time for the education otherwise there is a huge gap definitely for that yeah thanks suman so i think uh, we are coming up to the end of this discussion so uh, any last words from anyone before the wrapping up actually i want to make a last comment for the networkers uh, for my side that is apart from networking please take care of your health because my experience uh, the first one month i gained 4 kg then fortunately we do ramadan it reduced 6 kilo and uh, after one month again i again gain another 4 kilo so i don't know what happening to others so need to find out a way to maintain our health and also the mental health because we're doing extensively remote meeting online so sometimes i'm also getting annoyed and uh, misbehaving with my colleagues friends families so probably there we need to take care thank you very much yeah actually you can see my hair and what has happened to that <laughs> okay so thanks everyone and uh, i think it's time to wrap up the discussion and uh, actually there were several other questions in the q and a session and uh, we'll hope to uh, answer them offline and thank you everyone especially the panelists uh, back to you sena
Thank you so much. Um, and yes, we were all much more attractive before this all started. Um, that's a wrap, folks. Thanks to everyone has joined, who has joined us today, particularly uh, the presenters, the panelists, all the um, sub South Asian NOGs and PC volunteers. Thank you so much for your time and effort and consideration and work. Um, it's been just brilliant and a pleasure to work with you. And thank you to everyone for joining us today um, and sharing uh, this time with us. The presentation slides and session recordings will be published on the NFH website. Um, don't forget to register for the next two NFH events at nfh.apnic.net. We'll shortly be sending out an event survey. Uh, please do let us know how you think we went today um, because it means we can improve um, and address some things for next time. Um, thanks again. And we really look forward to collaborating again in the future. Stay safe.